Um, so my name is Torin Marcourt and I'm from Standards Australia and it is my pleasure to welcome you all today uh, to our workshop as part of the ASEAN Australia Digital Trade Standards Initiative. So I would like to first begin with an acknowledgement of Australia's Indigenous people. Uh, performing an acknowledgement of country is an important part of the path towards reconciliation within the Australian community. And as such, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the Eora Nation, the Gadigal and Bidigal people, where the workshop is being um, hosted from today in Sydney, and also to pay respects to their elders past, present and emergent. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the elders from all the lands and language groups across Australia and all other ASEAN countries. Um, so thank you. And now I would like to just go over a few quick housekeeping rules. Um, so everyone should, should automatically be on mute, um, but if you would like to speak, then please raise your hand and we'll be able to unmute you, unmute you and you'll be able to address the group. Um, otherwise, we do have the chat function, which of course um, you can use at any time to um, ask questions, share comments, um, and we certainly encourage you to do so. Um, and it's great to see so many people saying hello in the chat already. Um, and before I hand over to our first speaker and kind of kick off the, the formal presentations, I just wanted to provide a really um, brief overview of the session today. So today's workshop is all about deepening our understanding of the role that, that we can all play in, in shaping digital trade standards and the importance of ASEAN's involvement, um, and also highlighting some of the key areas where you might look to get involved. Um, so looking at the registrations uh, before the session today, it was great to see that um, we have quite a quite a good um, balance in the audience today between those that are already participating in standards development, uh, those that are completely new but interested in digital trade and potentially wanting to get more involved, and then those like me who work for a national standards body. So it's fantastic to see that, that good mix, and we hope that uh, today's session will kind of um, address all those different uh, kind of interest groups that we have. So we have an excellent set of speakers lined up. Um, and most of them are, well, all of them, I should say, are already heavily involved in digital trade standards, both from um, within ASEAN and Australia and also outside of our region as well. Um, so a special thank you to um, a few of our speakers who are dialing in from outside of business hours. That's always greatly appreciated. Um, and our speakers are going to cover a variety of topics, everything ranging from IT governance uh, through to accessible user interfaces. Um, and we encourage you to Ask questions. There will be um, a short amount of time at the end of each presentation for questions as well. Um, and then at the end of the session, we'll have um, an activity led by our international learning specialist, Brendan, uh, who will be looking kind of practically at what is required to get more involved. Um, and on that note, I will go ahead and hand over to our first speaker. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have Phil Wemblum with us today. He is uh, the Senior Director of Standards Policy at Intel and is also the Chair of JTC1. So he's going to provide a bit of an overview about what JTC1 is for those that might not be familiar and also about how JTC1 contributes to digital trade. So on that note, I will hand over to Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Torin. And it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I'm uh, here to give a little update on JTC1 and how it's relevant to digital trade. If you can move to the next slide for me. So JTC1 is a joint committee of ISO and IEC. It has two parents. It was created uh, in 1987, and its scope is information technology. And that means we develop standards for use by businesses, consumers, governments, and other organizations. Um, it, the, the work is organized in 22 subcommittees and uh, four JTC1 working level working groups. And it's one of the largest committees in ISO or IEC with uh, 4,500 participants and uh, we're currently working on nearly 600 standards. The next slide shows the uh, uh, 26 main areas of work and it covers really the, uh, the full range of information technology uh, that's uh, uh, relevant to the world today. Uh, a few to point out uh, would be uh, security and privacy. Uh, which is an important committee for uh, and, and program of work for many people. Uh, it's there is IT security techniques. Uh, I might also point out uh, cloud computing uh, and uh, artificial intelligence 
And some of the newest activities are uh, our working group on trustworthiness, uh, one on quantum computing, uh, some activity in data management, which is uh, uh, exploring how we can use data uh, without violating privacy principles. And we've recently added uh, some projects on digital twin to the committee that is working on Internet of Things. So um, I think there's really something for everybody here. On the next slide, um, these are the advisory groups that help JTC1 carry out its work. Uh, there's an advisory group uh, that I'd highlight on uh, emerging technology and innovation, which we call JETI. This is the uh, group which considers new uh, standardization, uh, potential standardization opportunities that JTC1 should pursue and helps uh, helps JTC1 prepare to address those in an appropriate way. Uh, another one I would point out is, um, sorry, still on that slide, um, is uh, the brain computer interface. This is an exciting, very new area uh, that was introduced to us by Jetty and is now being developed uh, uh, looking at ways that uh, the brain and the computer can communicate directly instead of having to type something at a keyboard, for example. Uh, we also are, are emphasizing collaboration uh, across domains, and we have an ad hoc that's developing some principles and some guidance for us to use, because JTC1 not only develops information technology standards itself, we also work with many other ISO and IEC committees to help them apply information technology in their application areas. On the next slide, uh, th this is the, uh, uh, the next slide has uh, our, our focus. Most of what we do is applicable across domains, uh, meaning uh, these are uh, IT standards, information technology standards that you would expect to see used in, in all different sectors, you know, healthcare, transportation, uh, education, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we sometimes talk about those as horizontal standards, uh, and, and that's most of what JTC1 does. But we also work together with other ISO and IECTCs that are applying information technology in their domains, and, uh, and we have over 400 liaisons that help us do that. And this is an increasing area of focus for JTC1. On the next slide. Some of the benefits of JTC1 standards uh, that I hope you'll think about our um, uh, interoperability. Uh, the JTC1 standards can enable interoperability among products and services from different suppliers. Uh, very important when you're talking about digital trade and, and global trade. Uh, we also, uh, our standards also facilitate global supply chains and enable cooperation among uh, suppliers, uh, which provides a foundation for global trade. Uh, standards often promote competition and that results in more cho choice uh, of uh, offering from different companies and, and ultimately, ultimately lower prices that comes from that, uh, uh, results from that competition. And that benefits everybody, consumers, businesses, uh, and governments. Uh, standards can also establish expectations and practices that result in higher quality products and services. Uh, so if, as, a, as a supplier, if you uh, show that you're uh, adhering to some of the expectations and standards uh, that can help uh, increase acceptance of your products. And uh, standards also encapsulate expertise and best practice, which allows everybody to use information technology more productively and safely without having to be a deep expert in each area. The next slide. Here, here are some examples uh, that I think illustrate some of those, some of those points. Um, the first one is uh, MPEG-4, ISO IEC 14496. This was developed by JTC1 Subcommittee 29, which spe specializes in uh, a coding and decoding of uh, moving pictures and still images. It does that in collaboration with ITUT Study Group 16. MPEG-4 is one of the most widely uh, implemented standards in the information technology sector. I'm, I'm quite sure that everyone who is using a, a, a mobile phone or a computer today is using an implementation of 14496. Uh, and it's important because this allows the uh, coded image to be decoded on every device in, in a way which is interoperable. So it's a good example of JTC1 standards enabling interoperability as I, as I mentioned on the previous slide. Another example is uh, 27001, which was developed by JTC1 Subcommittee 27, which really provides, it's a management system standard that helps ensure information security. And it's used by organizations all over the world 
to ensure the security of different types of data. Uh, it's one of the top selling standards. It's often important in supplier uh, customer relationships because uh, it, it helps an organization, a company, convince their supplier or their customer that they are uh, 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 they can be trusted uh, to protect data and to be a, 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 a viable link in the supply chain. A third example is um, a uh, standard from the biometrics area, ISO IEC 39794. This is the standard which is allowing incorporation of biometric data in e-passports. Um, which is an example of the kind of work that SC37 does also with SC17. And they work together with ICAO, the Civil Aviation Organization. Uh, so this is a good example of JTC1 appliance information technology expertise, specifically for one application area and working with an organization that has expertise in that area, uh, ICAO in this case. So on the next slide, uh, I would just want to wrap up here to, to highlight that international standards for information and communication technology have never been more important to the world. We're all connected. We're connected via information uh, and communication technology, and it's international standards that makes that work well. We would really welcome your participation to help shape the future foundation of digital trade. We really benefit from a diversity of perspectives and views. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, you just have to be interested. And it, it, it's this is a great time to get involved because most uh, almost all JTC1 meetings are fully virtual through at least 2021, and there's likely going to be the ability to participate virtually uh, beyond that. So it's not a, a great cost uh, to uh, explore some meetings and see what you're interested in. There's a lot more information about JTC1 available at the website jtc1info.org. Uh, and uh, I would very much welcome your questions either now or in the future. Uh, happy if you share my uh, contact information, Torin, and uh, we're available to, to help you if you want to get engaged and aren't sure where to start. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. I'm just having a look to see if there are any questions coming through. And if not, um, I might ask a quick question just on that final slide there, the point that you made about um, meetings being held held virtually now. I was just wondering if you could um, share some, some insights, both from kind of the practical side of participation as well as the technical side, any kind of um, major changes that you've seen since COVID um, in the topics that JTC1 is looking at, as well as, um, I mean, beyond kind of greater opportunities for increased participation, um, any changes as well in the process um, going virtual in this, this kind of setting? Uh, thanks, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question that we've talked a lot about within JTC1. Uh, by and large, our process is unchanged. Uh, the way we develop standards is the same. It's just now that everything is, uh, is a meeting like this that we conduct virtually. So it means we have to be a lot more efficient uh, because the number of hours in the day when you can get people from different time zones that where they're not up in the middle of the night is not very large. Uh, so there's, we have to be more efficient and we don't benefit from the opportunity to have uh, informal discussions. I think all of us who do this kind of work miss that. Uh, so it's a it's a little bit more difficult, but we're getting by. I don't think I'm not aware of any projects that have slipped uh, as a result of COVID. I think everyone has really adjusted well and and put in an extra effort. But we've also seen that some countries that had an interest uh, in participating but hadn't because it would have been expensive or inconvenient to travel a long ways to a meeting when they weren't sure that it was something they were interested in, they're they're joining us now. So it is, I think we've that's a great benefit from the pandemic. We're seeing a great opportunity. It's a great time to 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 try something out uh, and see if you'd like to get more involved. Thank you. And there's, uh, I think we have time for one more question here. So um, this is from FINA from the Malaysian Technical Standards Forum. Uh, just wondering if the discussion on e-passports includes the vaccination information related to COVID-19 and the issues um, surrounding that. That's a great, great question. Uh, so far, it does not, uh, because the, the passport projects that we work on have very long time frames. Uh, I mentioned that the, uh, that the that the projects we're doing now are, are becoming mandatory, you know, 
in 2030. So they, these, these projects, changes in passports are, are made over a long period of time. However, uh, I know our committee, uh, subcommittee 17 is doing some uh, looking at uh, the possibility of uh, vaccination passports or vaccination credentials. Uh, so it's something they're looking at. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. So we might, uh, well, thank Phil for his, his presentation, uh, first of all, and um, now turn to our next presenter, uh, who I believe was having some connection issues, but looks like we now have, have Teddy on the line. Um, and so this is moving as well into some of uh, our more kind of case study presentations on individuals' experiences in, in developing digital trade standards. And so uh, it's a pleasure to have Teddy Sukardi with us, who is chairman of the Indonesian Association of IT Consultants. And Teddy's going to talk a bit about his involvement in digital trade standards in uh, Indonesia. So Teddy, um, I will now hand over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you all hear me and perhaps see me? Yes. Okay. Now let me start. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, all for this opportunity for us to uh, participate. I'm fairly uh, happy and pleased and honored yeah, to be participating today. I'm now uh, located in the uh, city of Kudus, which is a red zone of COVID in uh, central Java. That's why you see me wearing a mask, okay? So uh, forgive me for not showing my full face. Uh, my topic will be more on the information technology standards uh, to support digital trade. I, am, I was able to get a glimpse on the joint technical uh, committee uh, from the previous uh, uh, speaker. And we have also adopted uh, some of the standards from the same uh, technical committee team in Indonesia. Okay, allow me to uh, start with the background of the trade and uh, standards. Uh, this is not uh, new. We have uh, always seen that uh, national trade or international trade has existed through history at the exchange of capital and services uh, among countries from a long, long way time ago. Uh, we have seen the uh, Egypt uh, history and Rome, uh, the Silk Road. Indonesia has also some history in the colonial times with the Dutch, where they also uh, conduct a lot of trading activities in our history. Now, but we have seen uh, changes in this area because of the wide uh, usage of the internet and digital technologies. And has, it has also further enhanced the international trade uh, in terms of size and also in terms of complexity. And that's why uh, management of information has become also more complex, uh, hopefully being addressed in the uh, 20,000 uh, standard series. Uh, I have a partial screen on my table. Uh, but let me just continue. Now, yeah, perhaps you can, uh, you know, reduce the size so on the left side can, can also be shown. This is a PDF uh, document. Okay, <clears throat> now that is the background. But we have uh, experience that we want to share uh, with you that the standards uh, will not be enough. So to have maximum impact standards, you need regulations and certifications. And these two areas require time and effort to materialize. Unfortunately, they have to be subsequent to the standard itself. After we have a local standard, national standard, then we can uh, start to uh, work on the regulation and certification. Now, the point is the stakeholders need to be aware and need to be actively involved uh, in contributing to the ecosystem of standard, not just the standards uh, by themselves, okay? So we need to look at the ecosystem. That's why uh, we have so many challenges because the standards are there, but uh, it is not giving the benefits to the society, to the industry, to trade uh, as we would expect it to be. Now, IT standards uh, in our uh, experience, 
we have adopted a lot of standards, uh, including uh, 22,000, 27,000 series. Now, but we have uh, understood that not all standards need to be adopted yeah? because some standard will be used by the community, by the industry uh, somewhat naturally. Okay? So some standards, uh, we don't need to spend too much time on it. Just use the existing ISO standards because the people industry can understand it perfectly. They work on it, they use it because they have the requirements to achieve interoperability between systems. Okay. But the problem is now more on the readiness of regulation and certifications that are often identified as, I would say, areas for improvement, another word for problems. Some areas are, will, re, will need more focus. Uh, those are personal data protection. We have seen a lot of uh, personal data, a lot of breaches are happening from month to month, from year to year. And this is becoming a big issue presently in many countries. We have seen also a lot of uh, attacks uh, that is in the form of uh, ransomware and such. So we have looked at these problems and now uh, we are focusing more in some specific areas. And those are among others, security. So what the Indonesian National Standard uh, Organization has uh, done and contributed is uh, among others, these standards. Uh, the 27,000 series, we have uh, 46 standards already, are now already in place, including regulation and certification. Yeah? It took some time for us to have certifications, but now it is starting to uh, happen. And also we have the uh, governance of IT, which is the 38505. Uh, the standard is quite old already, but uh, very often the problem is the governance of IT as well the service management of IT. And lately we have been able to also introduce the our own local grown, uh, homegrown standards for uh, data centers. As we know, uh, e-commerce, e-government, uh, and now with COVID, there is a lot of e-learning also happening. Students are learning from home. People are working from home because uh, of lockdowns. It is becoming more uh, a basic need to have a good support from data centers. And now we have uh, SNI 8799, which is the technical management and audit standard for data centers. Uh, we hope that these standards will also uh, standardize and also be a good reference for our local data uh, centers that are uh, expanding very uh, fast. So, next slide. Well, uh, my final uh, thoughts perhaps, uh, we believe in Indonesia at BSN and my teams uh, that the standard will continue to support digital product services, digital delivery and digital trade enablers. So this is going to continue to happen. Maybe it will even increase uh, significantly in the future. We also believe that further regional discussions on standard would open up opportunities for collaboration that benefit trade, including digital trade, as our topic is today. So uh, this is uh, some of the ideas that I've uh, put down. Uh, I welcome uh, any comments and any questions, uh, should there be uh, enough time for it. Once again, thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity and stay uh, safe, stay healthy to all of you participants uh, online of this event. Uh, returning to you, thank you. Thank you very much, Teddy. Um, I'm just having a look now at uh, a comment that's been submitted, um, thanking you and Phil for your presentations uh, and also sharing uh, work that's been done on an electronic uh, transaction act. 
um, that they're looking forward to hear um, about interoperability, digital trade, uh, connectivity. And there's a link there as well for anybody that's interested. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I noticed that you mentioned the 38505 uh, standard, which is a very excellent segue actually to our, to our next presenter. Um, so thank you again, Teddy. Uh, so our next presenter is Jan Begg, who is Managing Director of Azulin, and she is also Chair of the International Committee um, on IT Service Management and IT Governance, uh, the committee responsible for that specific standard. So um, a very excellent segue, and I will now hand over to Jan. Thank you. Yeah, have a nice day. Bye. Thank you, Teddy. That was interesting. And thank you for mentioning one of the SC40 standards. So pleased to hear that you found it useful. And uh, we hope that you'll come and join us as we further develop those, uh, those standards. But I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, thanks, Torin, and thanks, uh, Phil, for your words too. Um, I also um, am a non-executive director of an aged care facility here in, uh, well, several in uh, Victoria and Tasmania in Australia. So that gives me a, a, a different governance lens as well. Anyway, um, so thank you for the invitation to speak. I am the chair of SC40, which is one of the committees that Phil mentioned within JTC1, the Joint Technical Committee. We cover uh, traditionally called IT governance, but now more increasingly called digital governance, service management and business process outsourcing. I'm gonna speak in more detail about our experience in a couple of those areas. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the main focus of my time, I'll talk about the governance of data standards and the IT enabled business process outsourcing standards. Um, we have at the moment, um, out of the member countries, we've got Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines and Singapore are observing members. Uh, and we would welcome you to become more participating members, particularly as Phil said, with the meetings being held in, on Zoom. We're currently having our SC40 plenary uh, and that started on the 8th of June and we'll finish this week on the 24th of June. And while that's been going on, uh, the working groups, we had three working groups, and they've been meeting at various times of the day, night, afternoon, evening, whatever, depending on where you are in the world. So for our part of the world, uh, can be a bit challenging, um, but we're very conscious of that. And we have uh, further north in Asia, we have quite a few participating countries. So uh, you would be able to fit in quite well, I'm sure. So if we move on, um, here's a brief background about me. I do have a deep technical background in software development, outsourcing and technology operations. Um, I've also led uh, major transformation projects um, across multiple countries and um, I've held senior roles in Australia, UK and US. I've worked across many industry sectors. And as I said earlier, I'm uh, a non-executive director and um, I'm a fellow of AICD, which is the company directors uh, institute here in Australia. Um, I've had over 10 years uh, experience in um, international standardization. Um, and uh, in our SC40 committee, we've got, currently got 57 member countries. So that's split between the participating and the observing. We've got 25 published standards and nine under development. So that's a little bit about me. Um, this is where we fit. So we're, as I said, we're one of the uh, committees uh, in JTC1, which is part of IEC and ISO. So moving on, um, this uh, I just included this slide for reference if anyone wants to think about the history of SC40. We're one of the newer 
committees, but that doesn't mean that our standards are necessarily new. Uh, JTC1 did a rearrangement of some of the working groups and uh, committees within uh, the family and put us together in 2013 to look after the 38500 series, the 20,000 series, which I know a number of you in IT service management will be aware of, and the IT enabled um, 3105 business process outsourcing standards. So that's a bit of background about us moving on. Um, Here's a representation of how we fit in the business and corporate world. So our standards are closer to the business side of organizations. So we are at the governance of IT level, we're a subset, you can think of us as a subset of corporate or organizational governance. And that fits with the regulations uh, under which uh, and laws under which organizations operate. Uh, we then have the 20,000 and the 3105 series, which are management standards, and that assists organizations in the operational use of IT as well as the management of IT. And we have within those um, recognition of the market context in which organizations operate. And trade is obviously a very important part of that. And we have specific issues within each of those that we provide guidance on. So moving on, this is one example that I wanted to share with you. So if you are thinking about how do you get involved in standards, here's a journey um, which uh, was the one that um, Teddy mentioned earlier, uh, 38505 part one. Um, now that started as an idea um, discussed in June 2014, uh, just soon after SC40 had formed. So that was a really good byproduct of putting all of the, the different groups together. Um, and at that point, uh, an ad hoc study group was formed. So this is an early stage to discuss ideas. Anyone can participate and share their experiences. Uh, the following November, uh, that study group reported, um, that meeting was held in Delft and um, there were many country contributions put forward at that. So this was a way to work out, well, what's the problem uh, and what are the ways that we could offer some guidance or standardization in this space. By April 2015, contributions had been gathered into a framework and at the May San Paolo meeting uh, in 2015, New Zealand uh, proposed a new project for an international standard and China volunteered to be the co-editors in that project. In our meeting in 2016, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> in Suzhou, uh, work continued on a DIS ballot for 38505 part one, the one mentioned by Teddy earlier. Um, during that meeting, and this is uh, a bit of uh, an encouragement to show you some of the value that you get back as well as what you contribute, um, our hosts in Suzhou uh, organised a, a three-hour IT governance forum. We had 200 people there. A lot of local businesses came along. There was simultaneous English-Chinese translations and an enormous beneficial exchange of ideas between the people working in the standardization area and the local businesses that came along to this. So it was a really fantastic way of sharing ideas and thinking about the problems that we had in different countries and that contributed further to the development of standards in this area. By the time we got to 2016 and met in London, um, work had progressed onto 38505 part two, which is um, 
a technical report that includes some case studies of how you might use the 38505 part one. So that was that gives you a bit of a glimpse of how a very early stage uh, committee managed to take a very topical um, idea and put it into something that was more useful. And, um, and then further to that, we've also um, started work on the governance of data classification. Um, so we'd love people uh, from this part of the world to get involved in that too. So that's our journey and it continues. So here's my second example, which is the IT enabled um, business process outsourcing. Um, now, this was originally, I believe, before I got involved, it was originally an idea from India uh, and um, Japan were actively involved as well. As, an, as well as a number of countries. And the idea here was that IT enabled um, services uh, that were doing business process outsourcing needed to show, as Phil said earlier, a degree of trust that they are, the way they worked, the way they processed and looked after their clients was being done in a standardized way and hence um, would enable their clients to feel more confident uh, that they could not only sign up an agreement with a business process outsourcing supplier, but enable them to, at the end of one contract, to choose another provider if they wanted to and to have standard ways to exit one contract and engage in another one. Very important in the way that you uh, offer services internationally. So on the right hand side of this uh, slide, there's some examples of what sort of services, business process outsourcing uh, services are provided in this model. Uh, in the middle of the slide, there's um, uh, an estimate from 2015 that this market globally was worth about in US dollar terms, about 186 billion. And uh, more recently, it was valued around um, 330 billion in 2019, and I'm sure has uh, grown even further from there. So BPO focuses on the performance of the outsourced business process rather than the performance of the information system. So as I said earlier, we're a little bit closer to the business end uh, of uh, the trade and services rather than the um, technology end that's underneath it all, the data centers, the cloud services, etc. The evolution though, so from when this um, standard was first uh, published, um, there was quite an emphasis on co cost saving. But what we see in BPO now is that it's really about sustained performance improvements through standardization and the ability to uh, share the, the enhanced value between the client and the supplier or the provider. So if we move on to the next slide, um, here's some comments just about where we're at in our domain. Um, and this applies uh, to digital trade and to businesses more broadly. We are still seeing very rapid technological advances and um, with some of the things that Phil mentioned earlier around Jetty um, and new uh, ad hoc groups that are being formed, um, quantum computing and so on, we, you know, we have to keep responding to these technological changes uh, and the way that businesses can be conducted. And as the technology changes, people think up great new ways of having a business offering, whether that be in um, uh, services, data, or whatever it may be. Customers' um, expectations have changed, and we've seen that very much in the last 18 months or so with people uh, working more remotely and um, sourcing their um, goods and services electronically rather than going into a physical shop. Um, 
business operations are now done in a very data rich environment but there's a complex system of service provision. So the standardization in the service space is very important for trust and um, value for money as well. So the governance and management of these arrangements is critical for the success, survival and competitive advantages of businesses and for governments to have confidence that businesses are playing within the rules. Uh, for us, uh, we are continuing to develop, to develop the 38500 series governance of IT digital governance, the 20,000 series on service management and the uh, picture there is a handbook that we published recently on 20,000. I would uh, commend that to anyone who's uh, looking at IT service management. And uh, 3105 series, uh, we're continuing to develop the BPO uh, lifecycle processes that um, I was talking about on the previous slide. Key topics are governance of digital platforms, um, the ecosystems that are being created, governance of data classification, the 38505 part three, and consumer uh, engagement, so the consumer side of BPO, uh, continuous process improvement in BPO and more broadly across um, services. So moving on to the next one, uh, for reference I've included uh, our liaisons and collaborations. Um, we've got a long list of other committees that we have close um, uh, collaboration and arrangements with uh, including blockchain uh, and including a joint project uh, with um, artificial intelligence for the, the governance implications of the use of AI 38507, which hopefully we will see published very soon, hopefully within a year. Uh, so what does the future hold? Um, as I said, I think I've said most of these, uh, but I've included this for reference if anyone wants to go back and have a look at that. And uh, that will probably bring us to about the last slide, I would think. So I would encourage you to get involved and uh, if we've got time, happy to um, take any questions. Thank you, Jan. Uh, we do have time for a few questions, and I see that one has come in through the chat. Uh, so you mentioned that ISO 38500 is being reviewed, and what is the main reason for this review? Okay, this is our core, or um, we view it as our horizontal uh, standard uh, in uh, governance of IT. As I said at the beginning, some of the terminology in that space has changed. When uh, 38500 was initially developed, um, most medium and large organizations had an IT department. Um, they had uh, uh, business groups um, and mostly everything was done in-house. Um, and the governance of those arrangements was a very inward looking uh, process with um, reporting up to the CEO and the board or whatever the governance arrangement of the organization was. Companies look very different now. There's a lot of smaller organizations um, and we, we have published uh, updates to 38500 along the way and the principles, I firmly believe that the principles are still very applicable but we do need to modernize the language. We do need to explain how it fits in the wider way that organizations operate now. If you no longer have an IT department, um, then how does it fit? How do you think about it? What are the obligations of the management to think about the use of digital technology, the use of data. Some of those things are quite specific and there are other standards for that, like information security, privacy, et cetera. But the, at the more general terms, um, how do you think about that? And that's the sort of thing that we're doing. Um, it was due for a, a five-year review in any case. We ran an ad hoc um, or a study group uh, for a year and that reported uh, a very comprehensive uh, feedback from countries all over the 
the world about the sort of things that they'd like to see included and how it relates to other standards and how standards have been uh, developing in the meantime. So it's a much more outward looking rather than an inward looking and a modernization. I'm very pleased to say that just recently um, we have uh, appointed SC40 uh, has appointed a new editor for this process uh, from Australia, which continues a very long uh, uh, leadership role of Australia in this. Um, unfortunately, the previous editor uh, on this was uh, from Brazil and due to COVID just really could not continue uh, with this. Uh, so, um, but we have, uh, on the, the positive side, we've picked up a lot of other countries who are now participating. Argentina, for instance, was not participating before because they couldn't uh, afford to come to the meetings. And uh, so they're now actively participating as well uh, as many other countries. So I hope that sheds some light on it. Yes, thank you very much, Jan. Um, and we'll just to stick to time, we're going to have to um, move to our next presenter, but I see there are some other questions coming in. And if we have time um, at the end, we will certainly um, come back to those. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Khaled Choukri, who is CEO of uh, European Language Resources Association and also the chair of the International Committee on User Interfaces. So I will now hand over um, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Torin, and thank you for the uh, Australian uh, National Sedition Bureau for the invitation. I'm very uh, glad to be with you today. Can we just move to the uh, next slide? So here you can see the group behind SC35 and you see that there is still some space for those who want to join us. Can we move on? Next one. And you see that our meetings are rather easy to join even uh, during the, uh, the pandemic. Next one, please. So this is, uh, this is the SC35 scope, and let me read it uh, for you. Uh, in SC35, uh, the standardization we do is in the field of user system interfaces in information and communication technologies environment, support for these interfaces to serve all users, including people having accessibility or other specific needs with a priority of meeting the GTC1 requirements for cultural and linguistic adaptability. I have put in red the, uh, the keywords that are really important. And since we are talking about trade, I just want to some statistics that I want to share with you. Some of the surveys show that 40% of global consumers won't buy in other languages than their own. 65% prefer content in their native language. 73% want reviews of products in their language, even if it's poorly written. So basically people are talking about can't read, won't buy, and this is really important. So in terms of trade, your participation to our activities in SC35 is very essential. And since I uh, mentioned that uh, one of the role of SC35 is to uh, look into requirements for cultural and linguistic adaptability, it's really important for the communities that uh, uh, express cultural and linguistic uh, knowledge and expertise to join this. No one can uh, work on these issues uh, for you. You need to do it yourself or to do it for your indigenous uh, communities. Uh, as of today, we do have about 17 uh, participants, 17 observers. Our meetings have 40 to 50 experts, and we have about nine active working, gro uh, works, working groups that you will see at the end of, of my slide. Next one. In uh, SE35, we started from a very traditional user interfaces. Uh, we are all very familiar with keyboards, and uh, C35 is behind the uh, keyboards that you see today. But we are also moving to more innovative and uh, up-to-day uh, interfaces like wearable uh, haptic, and we are also working on effective computing. Uh, 
uh, the new uh, trends or the new important topics we are dealing with these days, as I said, effective computing. Uh, we set up a new working group to deal with that, to make sure that uh, our interfaces consider uh, emotions in, in uh, our interfaces when we, uh, we deal with uh, human machine interaction. And I will come back to that in, in a minute. Uh, we are also uh, considering immersive technologies. A very important piece of work is about how to uh, address all modalities that we see in our interfaces. It could be text, it could be audio, it could be visual, and we try to come up with standards that uh, highlight the way we convert some of these uh, modalities from one to the other. Basically, how we can go from uh, audio uh, content uh, to textual or how we can convert this into images and, and so on. Next one. These are the three uh, highlighting three important uh, accessible guidance. The first one is the guide 71. Uh, this is a guide for addressing accessibility in standards. Basically, this is a document that we would like all SCs and all GTC groups to adopt and look uh, into the details needed to address accessibility in their own work. The series 29138 is also an important uh, piece of work that addresses the user accessibility needs. We try to summarize all the needs of uh, different type of uh, users, different profiles. Uh, the uh, series 30071 is a code of practice for creating accessible ICT product and services. And this is a, a key element in, uh, in the trade today. So within SC35, we are dealing with uh, at least three uh, domains. We are dealing with uh, the use of IT in the traditional office and home environment, in uh, public and mobile environment, but also in uh, the emerging uh, environment like, like immersive technologies. Next one. So going back to the basics, I'm sure that uh, we are all familiar with the, uh, the keyboards. Uh, this is, one may feel that this is obsolete, but uh, for instance, the French government came uh, something like uh, four months ago with a new uh, keyboard that uh, accounts for all the French character, including the capital letters with diacritics. So I'm sure that if you look into your languages and uh, in many countries, you do have more than one, uh, this would be uh, an important uh, still an important piece of work to carry, uh, including the uh, tactile uh, keyboards, not only the, the physical one. Next one. We're also working on the gesture and gesture-based interfaces. I'm sure that if you uh, look into what we have on the market as devices today, you can see that uh, each of the manufacturing has its own way of uh, allowing interfaces using gesture. And this is something that uh, we would like to overcome uh, by making this somehow standardized. Can we move to the next one? So we, we carried an analysis uh, of uh, what we see in the market with uh, one finger, two fingers, three fingers, four fingers, and the different gestures and you see here at least three uh, major names in, in smartphone production. And you see that uh, these are slightly different. And in some cases, it is really uh, important to tell the consumers uh, that, okay, this is the state of art today, or at least the state of business, but we would like to harmonize this in, uh, in one way or, or another. Next slide, please. Another work we are doing is also to uh, try and to standardize the interfaces in this uh, emerging technology speech to speech translation or uh, simultaneous interpretation. Uh, imagine that uh, instead of speaking English this morning, I can speak French or my uh, mother tongue. 
and we do have an interface that allows you to uh, hear the uh, the sounds in English or, or in in Malaysian or in in other uh, in Malay or in other languages with my intonation with my prosody with my hesitations and and so on that's something we are working on in this uh, uh, speech to speech translation activities next one yeah let me skip that one this is uh, an example of an important uh, standard we are working uh, on this uh, the uh, 2007 one series. Uh, this is a, a multi-part standard, and they have highlighted here some of the important uh, content of each part. For instance, in part five, we are working on accessible user interface for accessibility sitting on information devices. How can we set up accessible uh, commands to make the devices accessible? Uh, in part 11, we are working on how to find alternatives uh, for images. If someone cannot really see uh, or understand images, we need to have some text that is an alternative explanation. Part 15 is a uh, guidance on scanning visual information for presentation as text. Again, how can we uh, move from one modality into text? Part 21 is guidance on audio description. And I think this will very likely become one of the most famous standards in our group. And we are uh, expecting this to be in, in, uh, in uh, legal systems, in legislation very, very soon to allow people who can't uh, see the uh, images get an audio description instead. Part 23 is about uh, guidance on the visual presentation of audio information. How can we present audio information uh, through captions or through subtitles? And 25 is uh, guidance on the audio presentation of text in videos, all the text that we see embedded in videos, how we can present them in, in other ways. Next, please. I mentioned this affective computing user interface. I think this is uh, uh, also a very sensitive uh, work we, we are doing, and we are trying to understand emotions and sentiments when we are dealing with interfaces. Uh, if we see the next slide, this is the way we are uh, looking into that. Uh, we have the uh, human uh, or, or the user, uh, interacting with a computer, for instance. Uh, basically, if, if you are interacting with, uh, with customers and you, if you realize that your customer is happy, you can allow for some automatic tr uh, transaction or automatic uh, interaction. But if your customer is really upset, you may want to send him to an operator that would uh, deal with, uh, with the, the case in a more clever way. So what uh, this uh, work is about is to understand the, uh, how we are acquiring this emotion, how we are analyzing them, and how we are uh, exploiting them in interfaces. And of course, here again, uh, I'm not sure that emotions are culturally uh, neutral. Uh, it's very likely that uh, the way we express ourselves or our emotions are uh, linguistically and culturally uh, dependent. Next one. This is a, a more recent uh, work we are doing on making our document easy to read and easy to understand. We assume that uh, it's so easy to read technical documents or even uh, ordinary document. But if you look at, uh, if, if, you, if I start reading Shakespeare today, uh, I'm not sure that uh, the English uh, of that time would be uh, easy for me to understand. And it might be even difficult to understand the whole, uh, even translated English. So maybe I do need some uh, nonverbal explanations here and there, maybe some dictionaries that uh, account for my cognitive capacity, for my linguistic capacity and so on. And this easy to read and easy to understand work is, is about that. Next, please. 
here you can see uh, where our uh, pa uh, participants and observers are. You see that we have a, a, a number of observers in, in your area. But uh, as Phil said, uh, Jan and, and, and Torin, there is really a need for experts uh, to, uh, to join us. We, we are using this uh, expression experts in, in, a, in, a, in a more, uh, uh, let, let's, let's take it as a naive way to uh, talk about ourselves. What we need is really people who are motivated, who know what's going on in their countries and who can bring their own feelings, that their own uh, uh, emotions, their own uh, motivations to our activities. I think I will, I will stop here. I'm happy to take questions uh, afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was, well, for me, at least a very eye-opening presentation. Um, I think a lot of topics covered that, uh, for me at least, I don't, you know, think about um, on a daily basis. So thank you for that. Very eye-opening. Um, I've just seen a question come through. Uh, so if, if more countries were involved, would you see more languages be covered by SC35? Absolutely, absolutely. We, we try to be uh, open-minded uh, and we, we do have uh, people from, from different countries and from different uh, cultural uh, background. But of course, people with different languages might bring in uh, different uh, flavors of, of activities, absolutely. Fantastic. And um, I like that point that you raised at the end as well about uh, everyone doesn't necessarily need to be a technical expert on all of these details, but having that kind of um, attitude and willingness to, to really address this important topic, um, which is also, again, a lovely segue to our next session. Um, I got in trouble in our last workshop because I cut Brendan's time very short. So I'm very conscious in this workshop that I need to stick to time. Um, but thank you to Khaled, to all of our presenters um, before this as well, and also to everyone that's submitting questions and comments um, in the chat as well. Um, so I will just... Now I see Brendan's slides are up. Um, so last but certainly not least, we have um, Brendan Slowey from Standards Australia, who's going to be kind of shifting the focus of, a work, of the workshop a little bit, a bit more of a practical session um, that should hopefully apply to those of you that are kind of thinking how I might be able to get more involved, as well as um, those of you at the workshop that might already be involved in standards development. So I will not take any more of Brendan's time. Uh, the floor is yours, Brendan, thank you. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, uh, Torin, and thank you uh, to Phil, to Teddy, to Jen and Dr. Khalid for those excellent, excellent presentations. And I really look forward to getting the slide deck after this and going back and going, going through and making some notes. I've seen a couple of the questions that have been raised uh, in there. I'm currently working on some stuff to do with artificial intelligence. So my brain's been kind of going haywire. I've been trying to stay focused on this. So. Um, uh, yeah, as Torrin said, uh, I'm Brendan, I'm an uh, international learning specialist here with Standards Australia, and I want to just take you through a quick session this afternoon that will look at how we can increase our activity in developing digital trade standards. Um, we've got an audience today that's got a, a mixed level of experience when it comes to standards development. So for the more experienced of you, we can maybe consider some of this content as a, a good refresher. Now, what we'd like to do is we want to start off the session uh, just with a quick question around how you can potentially get more involved. So I'm just going to run a quick poll here. Uh, thank you very much uh, for my, some of my help behind the scenes there. So how can you get more involved in digital trade standards? I'd like you to just answer this question. So is it A, contact ISO and IEC directly and request to be added to the International Technical Committee? B, contact your national standards body and request uh, that they have ISO and IEC add you to the International Technical Committee. C, contact your national standards body and inquire about their current international DTS initiatives and how you can get involved. Or is it uh, D, email Torren directly and ask her to put your name forward to ISO and IEC. So, 
got 15 votes through. So the votes are starting to come through. All right. All right, we'll give maybe another, we're we gonna be about half, halfway there. Okay, um, so we've closed polling, all right. Um, so let's just take a, a look at those results. So we, we've got 60% of people who've said contact our, our national standards body and inquire about their current international digital trade standard, uh, standards initiatives and how you can get involved. That is exactly what we're looking for. Uh, Tyron, worryingly, we've got a couple of people here who wanna reach out to you directly. Um, but that's okay. So guys, let's take a, a, a little bit more of a, a closer look at that. We can stop sharing that poll right now. Thank you so much. Um, so the best way to get involved in, uh, in international digital trade standards is through your national standards body via a national mirror committee. Now that national mirror committee acts as a national counterpart to the international technical uh, committee. They review the work of the international technical committee and they provide contributions and comments on drafts of those international standards. They help develop national, a national position and the National Mirror Committee also work with the NSB to select delegates to participate on the international technical committees. The National Mirror Committee shapes your country's contributions uh, to that international committee, which ultimately shapes the content of international standards. Participation on the National Mirror Committee also means that you're getting kept up to date on advancements and initiatives from other countries within that field. Now, I just wanted to also flag, as we've discussed in previous workshops, that it's really important your committees have a diverse uh, group of stakeholders who are involved. When considering the constitution of committees and the representatives that you select for international technical committees, gender is also a really important consideration. Now, both ISO and IEC have made pledges to encourage equal representation in standardization to strengthen the participation of women in the, development of in, uh, in the development of international standards and to make those international standards more relevant to women around the world. This also helps to support goal five of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is to achieve gender equality and to empower all women and girls. So we've talked a little bit about the National Mirror Committee and the International Technical Committees. Let's take a look at some of the roles and responsibilities of each. So with our National Mirror Committees, they play a key role when it comes to standards development. And they are, they're responsible for managing your national contribution to international standards. They're managed by a national committee manager, uh, sorry, national committee manager, pardon me, or secretariat. They nominate delegates to participate on those international technical committees. They consult with interested parties at national level where needed to. They coordinate votes on international, ballot, uh, international ballots. And they also propose the national adoption of those international standards. When we look at international committees uh, at a very high level, they're responsible for drafting those international standards. They're made up of endorsed representatives from your country working with endorsed representatives from other countries that make up that international committee. And they are managed by an international committee manager or secretariat. Now, your national contributions to an international technical committee also depend on your country's level of participation. So let's take a look at the different types of members that we see in our international technical committees. So, when your country's involved in an international technical committee, there are two levels of participation that you can choose from, uh, being a participating member, uh, a P member as it, as it is, or an observing member, an O member. Now, each of the two roles have a set of responsibilities. We're gonna do another quick poll with you just to see how we go. Um, so Summer, if you could uh, launch that second poll for us. So we wanna know which of the following can a participating member, a P member do, but an observing member cannot do. All right, got a, got a couple of votes in so far. All 
All right, we're about halfway there in terms of the votes or 33% of the votes. About 50% of the votes are in. All right. All right, Sam, I think we can, uh, we'll end the polling there. And if we can just share those results with everyone. Um, so very good. So when we're looking at the those polling results, uh, we got the overwhelming favourite there, which is, vote on the draft of international standards. So absolutely correct. Let's take a look at in a little bit more detail um, in, in regards to those P&O members. So um, these are the high level roles and, uh, on screen. You can see the high level roles and responsibilities of both the P and the O members. And these are taken directly from the ISO membership manual. So when we're looking at P members, we want them to actively participate in the international work we want them to monitor all work, uh, all work items uh, from that international committee. We want them to attend in international committee meetings. We want them to comment on drafts and they have an obligation to vote on all draft international standards. Now our O members, so they to all work items of the international committee, they will attend international committee meetings and dependent on whether they're a full member uh, or a correspondent member, this last, uh, this last bullet point will apply. So if they're a full member, um, they will be able to comment on those draft international standards and final, uh, final draft international standards. Uh, as I said, that's for full members only. Now, this really highlights the value in participating in standards development even, uh, even if you're only participating as an observing member. The exposure to the content um, of developing digital trade standards and the ability to comment on them and to influence them. So one of the things that we, I guess that we wanted to touch on, so it's a, I guess a key privilege for both O and P members, um, and that's full O members, um, is they have the ability to comment on international drafts. And as this is such an important function, there's just some tips that we'd really like to call out. The first of which is commenting early in the process. So it's important that technical comments are provided at the earliest stage of the work. Um, this is because issues can arise if committee members withhold them until the voting stages of the draft, where these issues can become time consuming to discuss and address. Um, now, also, there's no opportunity to modify the document once it's reached the stage of final draft vote. Um, at this stage, you're, you're only going to be able to um, vote a yes or a no. So no, no further comments will be um, considered. So best practice when we're talking about the use of comments is to uh, comment as early as possible. The second thing that we want to address is suggested amendments. They need to be clear and constructive. So all comments should be clear and, uh, clear and constructive and where required, um, accompanied by a technical justification. Wherever possible, um, we would like suggested solutions to be provided alongside your comment. The last one is advocating your national position. So by participating at an international uh, in an international technical committee, members are responsible for communicating and advocating your country's national position on a standard. Now, this position is determined by your National Mirror Committee, if you can think back to the, that uh, little image we uh, showed on the second slide there. So it's really important that you attend meetings because you can provide justification for your comments and votes and ensure that your national perspective has been communicated and your needs, your national needs are being met. So there are some other things that you should be aware of as an O member. And uh, the three things that we want to talk about here is the first of which is the structure of meetings, the different types of meetings that you'll see. So it can be confusing at first with the different types of meetings that you'll see, plenaries, subcommittees, working group meetings. 
Um, so just to quickly go through them, plenary meetings are the formal meetings for international technical uh, committees. They usually focus on the strategic direction of the work by discussing projects, reports from working groups, and they make decisions relating to the standards. These decisions are usually done within those plenary meetings. If an international committee uh, manages a large scope of work, they may also create subcommittees. And some of the presentations that we've had today have detailed um, some of those subcommittees from JTC1. Now, a subcommittee, uh, underneath subcommittees, there's working groups, which are specialised groups from within that committee that are focused on drafting a particular standard or specific elements relating to a standard. Working group meetings are highly targeted and they focus more on the technical detail. PRO members can nominate delegates to participate in working groups, and these members are individual experts on the technical document itself and do not have to be representatives of a specific country. They're chosen based on their expertise uh, in a specific topic. Uh, next, the different types of documents that you should be aware of. So the two types of documents that we wanted to call, uh, call out when you're participating uh, is resolutions. So these documents detail the formal decisions that the committees come to and draft agendas. So this is just to be aware of what's being discussed in each meeting and determine which meetings that you actually want to take part in. It's important uh, for the mirror committees to review the agendas uh, and any additional documentation in, in advance so that you're prepared, pardon me, prepared to put forward a national position at the meeting and be an active participant. Um, and then finally, uh, attending meetings. So some of the, I guess, some of these details, they might sound complicated and attending meetings actually helps to provide the full context to the discussion and the background around any decisions that have been made. Correspondent members of ISO and affiliate members of IEC can nominate delegates to committees as an O member. Uh, as we also mentioned on the previous slide, it allows you to advocate for your comments and to convey your national position. And when in doubt, we want you to remember that your national standards body is also there to support your attendance and active participation. Now, let's look at some additional ways that uh, members can increase their involvement. So there are a variety of ways that observing members can get more involved in DTS development. The first of which is by attending more meetings. So the best way to get involved and to build your capacity regarding digital trade standards is to start participating on international meetings. As Phil mentioned in his first presentation that we had today, there is no better time to get involved than now. With the transition of meetings to the virtual environment, it provides increased opportunities for experts to get involved at a minimal cost. Uh, the second of which, uh, the second way to get more involved is commenting on international drafts. So as we said before, one of the major benefits of being an observing member outside of being able to attend these committee uh, meetings is the ability to comment on draft international standards. And of course, we're talking about full O members. Your comments can be considered by the committee and may potentially influence the final content of the standard itself. Uh, the next one is something that we're actually very passionate about here at Standards Australia, which is the twinning or mentoring program. So the international standardizing bodies uh, they're always looking for ways and means to enhance participation of developing country members. And one form of building capacity or developing national standards bodies is through the ISO twinning and IEC mentoring programs. In fact, Australia is currently providing IEC mentoring for Cambodia. In a twinning or mentoring agreement, two members work together with one member, the, the lead partner, acting as a mentor to build capacity of the less experienced member, the twinned partner, often a developing country. Now, if there are any digital trade standards committees uh, where your country is participating in and you're interested in setting up a twinning or mentoring arrangement, then please let us know. Australia or any or another Asian member state may even participate on that committee and be able to act as the lead partner. Um, the final way of getting more involved as an O member is, of course, to become a P member. As discussed previously, this will give um, your country a more active voice 
by allowing them to vote on ballots that shape the content of those international standards. Okay, so finally, we just want to leave you with, uh, with one little thing here. So our workshop's been themed around a, getting a deeper understanding uh, on participation in digital trade standards. But now we want to encourage you to get more involved. So we're running the Standards Australia Hop into DTS Challenge. Standards Australia will be touching base uh, with your national standards body between now and our next workshop. We'll be asking uh, each NSB to notify us on uh, any digital trade standards meetings that their country has registered for and attended. Um, we'll pull together the entries and draw, uh, and draw a winner uh, who will win some fantastic Australian themed prizes. So uh, as you can see, just up there on the screen, uh, if you complete your, uh, our post workshop survey, uh, there'll be a question in there regarding what actions that you plan to take to increase your involvement in digital trade standards. And with that, um, I'd like to pass back to Torrin. So I've, I've kind of, I tried to condense everything as quickly as I could there for you, T. And uh, there we go. Great, thank you so much, Brendan. Um, and I think we were so concerned about, about time this workshop that now we've somehow magically um, <laughs> are running nine minutes ahead of schedule. <laughs> um, so I'll just take one final opportunity if anybody has any questions, not only for Brendan, but for any of uh, the other panelists as well, with the exception of Teddy, who unfortunately had to run to his next meeting, but we will take um, any additional questions. There was a question that came in about the presentations and and I can confirm that we will be sharing the presentations um, on the project page on our website. We will have um, everything available. Um, and I don't see any other questions coming through. So I might just, um, I'll give you another, another minute or so, but I'll um, talk to the survey that we have on the screen, just following up from, um, from what Brendan said. So as always, we are really keen to hear your feedback um, on this workshop, on the workshops that we have coming up, past workshops. Um, you know, we're keen to constantly be improving and making sure that our workshops are, you know, really meeting, meeting ASEAN's needs. Um, so Summer has put a link to the workshop in the chat. Um, Summer, I think maybe that's just gone to panelists. We'll um, send that around to the attendees as well. So everyone should get that link. Otherwise we have the QR code on the screen, which if you'd prefer to fill out the survey with your phone, you can do so as well. Um, I can see we have one question that's just come in for Khaled. Um, so the question is, how do you ensure that the translation factor uh, in cross-culture difference? Oh, well, that's, that's really a, a very, very uh, crucial question. Uh, it has to do with translation uh, in, in general. And uh, we are, uh, the, the technology today, the machine translation uh, technology is, uh, is based on this uh, data-driven paradigm. We try to learn from examples. So we try to mimic what the human translators are doing and hopefully the uh, human translations account for some of the culture. But uh, of course, most of the uh, domains in which the uh, automatic translation is applied is in technical domains. And we hope that uh, the cultural aspect is, is minor. But uh, join, join some of our works and we will uh, try to, uh, to deal with that all together. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through, so I might ask kind of one one final question for um, for our presenters, um, and that is essentially if you had one piece of advice for um, somebody that was was fairly new to um, the international standard system, um, what would what would that advice be? And if anybody wants to jump in first. <laughs> I, I think what uh, Brandon said about this tethering is really an important uh, way to go. I, uh, I have been with ISO for, uh, for more than a decade, and uh, I, I would uh, have loved to get a tutor at that time to take me through all the ISO jargons, for instance. So I think this is really an excellent way to go. Uh, joining groups and joining meetings is also uh, another another way in, in, many, uh, in many groups. Uh, we have these working groups that are small 
and uh, can can easily uh, incorporate newcomers. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I think Jan might be keen to, to go next. Thanks. Um, yes, I think uh, Brendan's uh, advice was was very good. Uh, I uh, what I find is uh, if something interests you, go with that first. Um, if something interests your employer, uh, then that's also a good place to start. Um, and um, we've got. I think we've formalized over the last couple of years, we've really formalized that help and induction process um, to, to help get over that acronym uh, barrier that uh, we all have when we go into something new. So buddying up with someone, getting a good induction and starting with something that interests you would be my advice. Thanks, Jan. And Phil, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Well, I think Jan said it very well. I agree with Khalid and Jan. Uh, if you have an interest, uh, give it a try. Get uh, Come come, let us see us and uh, try getting involved. I think you'll learn from it. You'll benefit from it. And uh, the international standards will be better too. Thank you. Well, I think that's a perfect line to end on. Um, once again, I'll throw in my shameless plug for the survey <laughs> and also thank um, all of our presenters, all of our attendees again. Um, I hope to see you all at our next workshop in September. That's on the 15th of September and we'll be providing um, more information via your standards body via um, ASEAN as well and um, enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you.